we will, let me just see what's going on in the chat. Okay, great, great, great. Okay. Great. Emily. Yeah, well, I would love to kick us off. Um, thank you all so much for joining us on this lovely Wednesday afternoon to talk about how we can bring in the pollinators into our homes and gardens. This is a program from Our Water, Our World, and it's sponsored by um, two of the local, local sewer districts here in Solon, Solano County. Um, I'm from the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District, and our co-host is the Vallejo Flood and Wastewater District. And so we work to collect the wastewater from your homes, treat it, clean it, and safely um, discharge it back to the environment. And in our case, um, that is to the magnificent Sassoon Marsh. And one of the ways that we also work to keep our environment clean and protect the marsh is by partnering um, with programs like Our Water, Our World, and how we can manage and minimize and appropriately apply um, pesticides and in our environment and also bring back pollinators like what we're going to talk today. So I'm very much looking forward to learning from the amazing Susan, uh, Suzanne Bontempo. And I'm going to read a little bio here about Suzanne because I think her title here, um, though amazing, is her experience is incredible. So Suzanne is a program manager for Our Water, Our World, and she works as an environmental educator teaching the principles of integrated pest management for sustainable, eco-friendly pest management around the home and garden. She has worked as a professional gardener for over 20 years. She is an integrated pest management adv advocate, a Rescape Bay-friendly qualified landscaper, a QWEL certified and master composter, and loves teaching folks how to grow bountiful gardens that are also safe and healthy for you, your family, and the environment. So with that, Suzanne, take it away. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really nice. Um, yeah, and thank you. And Vivian, I see that you're here. It's so great to have you. It's so great to for everyone to join us this, this afternoon. It's always a treat, and I'm really happy that we can all uh, spend this time together. So I'm going to go through slides for a real solid 45 minutes. I've got a lot of uh, content that I want to share. And, um, and I will be reading off some of my notes because there's some uh, facts, data I don't want to mix up. And then we'll leave time for your questions at the end. So please go ahead and type those questions in the Q&A as they come up. And then Emily will assist at the end of the program. And what we're going to learn is for those of you that are not familiar with the Our Water, Our World program, I'm going to just provide a brief introduction. And then we're going to talk about what pollination is why pollinators matter, uh, how to welcome them into our gardens. I'm going to introduce you to some of our pollinators that we see, and then we're gonna talk about how we can protect them. So the Our Water, Our World program is uh, a really cool program that is designed to provide education to the consumer, to you, to us as the general public uh, in regards to less toxic, uh, pest management. We partner with retailers that sell pesticides and we provide them with education around uh, eco-friendly alternatives. And we will also uh, provide um, a literature rack, the picture on the left that has the fact sheets. Those are one sheets that anyone can take that will address certain pest problems such as ants, around the home or aphids in the garden. We also have QR codes, which feel free right now to take out your phone and to look up the QR codes that will take you directly to the Our Water, Our World website, either in English or in Spanish. And then you'll also notice at our local um, retailers that sell pesticides that we place um, these little eco-friendly shelf tags that will help guide you straight to the products that are not going to pose a threat to our waterways. Um, and we provide IPM or integrated pest management education. So everything we provide is going to be science-based and it's going to be for sustainable long-term results. And how this um, relates to our gardens, 
um, and water quality is that um, I like to uh, remind everyone that our gardens are very much like a watershed. So in a watershed, when rain falls, any water that isn't absorbed into the soil is then going to run off into a local stream that will then gather to a local creek, to a local river, to an estuary, and then out to the bay or the ocean, depending where we are. In some cases, the delta is going to be a big part of that. Um, and along the way, it's going to be uh, grabbing and taking with that water any litter or pet waste or debris, any types of chemical residuals that might be present, um, motor oil, um, things like that. Um, so when we're looking at our gardens, understand when we do get rain or if there is a sprinkler that happens to be broken, and, um, and after a rain event, of course, water is still kind of moving across our properties. It's certainly moving over our roofs of our house and our garage, and it can um, move down sidewalks and pathways, maybe down driveways. And along the way, it, it can also move across a, a lawn or any garden areas that might be at a, a grade that can um, take the water with it. But as it's moving towards the uh, storm drain, which is out in the street, or if you don't have a storm drain, if you don't have a sidewalk, maybe it's gonna find its way to a local creek. Uh, but along the way, it's picking up any uh, synthetic pesticides, I'm sorry, synthetic fertilizers or, or pesticides that we may have used around the garden. So understand, uh, when we're not using eco-friendly or organic fertilizers, eco-friendly pesticides and organic fertilizers, the chemical pesticides and fertilizers have residuals that will stay and linger and can get uh, can move very quickly and easily with any type of runoff. So with that, we uh, promote the Our Water, Our World program and provide alternatives to any of those toxins that might get into our waterways. That was a mouthful. So let's talk about pollinators. So what is pollination? So pollination is accidental reproduction. So it's usually a, a pollinator is something like a bee that visits a flower, sips some nectar, or gathers some pollen, um, and then transfers the pollen uh, among other plants of the same species. So this allows the plants to make seeds and reproduce. Um, bees, uh, butterflies, hummingbirds are probably the most uh, familiar pollinators, but beetles, moths, and a few flies and wasps are also pollinators. And in tropical areas uh, around the you know, globe, we see bats, lizards, spiders, even some small mammals, such as the honey possum that provides their important pollinating services. So it is pretty cool. It is pretty cool. So Here's an illustration of the flower anatomy. I thought we could just, you know, start from, you know, the basics. And pollination is when a pollinator, such as that bee, uh, lands on one flower uh, before flying to another, of course, of the same uh, flower species, and is taking the pollen from the first flower and moving it to the second. So uh, it's that easy, it's that basic. Sometimes it's going to be both male and female parts on the same flower, and sometimes it's going to be uh, male parts and female parts on different flowers. Something important to understand if we're growing zucchinis and we need to self-pollinate those due to lack of pollinators. But that's for our next pro uh, program. All right, why do pollinators matter? Well, um, roughly 75% of all food crops and about 90% of all flowering plants on this earth need help with pollination. Uh, our, pollinators, our pollinators are responsible for bringing us one out of every three bites of food. Did you know that? I mean, that's incredible. I just recently learned this. Um, pollinators provide pollination services for over 180,000 different plant species and more than 1200 crops uh, commercially. So that means um, if we wanna talk money, what this means is that pollinators add $217 billion to the global economy, okay? Honeybees, uh, honeybees alone are responsible 
for between $1.2 and $5.4 billion in agriculture productivity in the United States alone, just the United States. So without the action of pollinators, our agriculture economies and our food supply and surrounding landscapes would completely collapse. And then also something I never consider, um, and maybe you don't either, but uh, the pollinators are essential for biodiversity. Um, in addition to the food we eat, pollinators support healthy ecosystems that clean the air, that stabilize soils, that uh, protect from severe weather events and support other wildlife. Pollinators also sustain our ecosystems to produce our natural resources. So pollinators contribute to biodiversity, a key measure of a healthy ecosystem. So um, those are things that we don't really always consider that I just like to share. So why are pollinators in a decline? Well, there's a lot of reasons and it gets a little complicated. So we can't just say it's one thing, but one reason would be loss of uh, habitat uh, from agriculture, urban development, and fires, unfortunately. Um, another component is the introduction of non-native plant species. Non-native plant species can lure pollinators aware, away from the native species, and native species are always going to provide uh, higher quality of nutrition. Um, they're going to be more nutrient rich for uh, our, our pollinators. So it's kind of like the non-native species might be a little bit like junk food for uh, the pollinators. I mean, that's a little bit exaggerated, but maybe you understand. Uh, climate change certainly has a big part of uh, pollinator decline. Um, pollinators from warmer uh, temperatures um, you know, warmer climates will move more northward and displace uh, the native pollinators. Um, so there'll be a little bit of competition. And then of course, pests and diseases. We've heard a lot about, you know, parasitic mites and different pathogens that are your, that the European honeybees get faced with. Uh, we are unaware of uh, the extent of this with native bees just because it's not um, easy to study the native bees in the same fashion as it is with European honeybees. Of course, pesticide usage is going to have a big impact on pollinators. Uh, even when the products are applied in accordance to the EPA's guidelines, many pesticides, including some eco-friendly pesticides, really impact the bees and other pollinators. Um, it can kill them outright, uh, it can reduce uh, the pollinators' abilities to reproduce. Uh, it also can reduce their uh, resistance to disease, um, impair their ability to navigate, and also impact their nervous system. So there's a lot of things we really want to be mindful when we use pesticides. And of course, only eco-friendly pesticides. We do want to use caution and be aware of any unintended consequences, but I'll touch on that in a bit. And then of course, pollution. Another thing that I don't consider is that the heavy metals, the diesel, synthetic fertilizers, especially nitrogen, um, evening light pollution uh, are just a few things that really do have an incredible impact uh, on pollinators, uh, which unfortunately are um, unfavorable. So, how can we help them? What do we need to do to create a pollinator habitat? So let's get on the positive side of this. Well, food, okay? We can provide them with some food. Uh, native plants provide uh, higher nutrients for the, a variety of wildlife, including our pollinators. So favor native plants whenever possible. A uh, place to raise their young. Wildlife needs resources to nest and reproduce, to rest and to protect and nourish their young. So finding places around your garden that can actually be a safe shelter for them. You know, this could in include uh, trees. Simply by just having a tree in your garden is going to provide some shelter. Um, and things like, you know, and shrubs and um, 
you know, maybe uh, a nice uh, uh, garden bed with a lot of native poly, uh, perennials could, you know, where they can run in and out, um, little nooks and crannies to stay. And then of course, a sunny and safe place uh, for bees, butterflies and hummingbirds. You know, they all love a sunny spot that's relatively undisturbed by pets. But also if we have children in the family and we have like a pollinator bank of flowers that we have specifically uh, planted to attract and support pollinators, let's have the children avoid playing tag or frisbee or catch over in those areas. Let's have them uh, maybe play in another area that isn't as sensitive or, ne or um, can be safely disturbed. Something else we wanna do is to keep in mind is um, provide a water source. So uh, this could also be a stream or a little spring. However, where I live, it gets very hot and dry and I'm in the North Bay and um, well, actually from you, I'm South, but still hot and dry like you all get. And I like to get a, a, a glazed saucer and I'll put some pebbles in it, garden pebbles, and I'll fill that water up halfway up the pebbles. So the pebbles are there so the pollinators such as this bee in this picture can land safely without drowning. Um, what I found is that especially during um, times of drought, which we are in, our pollinators and our beneficial insects also need uh, uh, water. Um, you'll, it's a joy to see the bees and butterflies taking advantage of your, um, of your little uh, watering station here. It's pretty fun. And then we wanna provide sustainable gardening practices. So we wanna maintain our gardens in natural ways to ensure the soil and air and water stays healthy and clean and free from poisons. And then of course, um, we wanna provide some cover. So pollinators need a place to take shelter from bad weather or places to hide from predators, uh, that want to um, hunt them, um, you know, so birds and such. So if I have, um, uh, let, let's say butterfly uh, caterpillars like on my dill, oftentimes I'll tent some bird netting over it so that they can continue to feed, but I know the birds won't come down and enjoy a nice afternoon snack. So let's meet some of the friends, um, some of our pollinators that we see commonly in the garden. So butterflies are going to be uh, very common, very popular. You know, everyone loves butterflies. Uh, there's more than 1300 butterfly species native to California, which is really fun. Um, it's really fun to get out there and observe who's visiting the garden. They come in a lot of different uh, sizes, some really tiny to about two to two and a half inch wingspan. So lots of shapes and sizes. Um, butterflies are very active during the daytime and they will visit a variety of flowers. So having a variety of flowers to offer is really going to be important. Um, butterflies do probe for nectar. So typically uh, having flowers that look like a daisy or a sunflower so they can kind of um, land on it and really take advantage of the cluster of all the little flowers that are in the middle of that daisy or sunflower is going to uh, be a lot of bang for the buck for the butterflies. Um, uh, and they do have very good vision, so they don't really need to have a lot of fragrant plants around. So fragrance is not important for butterflies, but uh, a lot of bright colors is going to be helpful. And then understand that the host plants for butterflies may be different than the plants that they gather nectar from. So what I mean by this is that we are all familiar with milkweed. Milkweed is uh, the host plant for the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly will lay its eggs on the milkweed. When those eggs hatch, the caterpillar will exclusively only eat the leaves of the milkweed. We want to not, uh, we, we want to avoid planting the non-native milkweed because that interrupts the migration cycle. We really want to favor the native milkweed. Um, and so then that caterpillar, as it's growing, is going to get all its nutrition, everything it needs specifically from that plant. As it then uh, completes its uh, metaphor metamorphosis into a butterfly, then the adult monarch will then go about and forage nectar 
uh, from a variety of flowering plants, but it will specifically only uh, lay its eggs on the host. So uh, something to understand is that butterfly, I'm sorry, caterpillars also uh, have multiple instars, which means they will grow and shed their outer skin. So this is the uh, anise swallowtail. This is a very uh, early instar. They're very little. These were a little smaller than an inch. And over time, they'll become less black and more of that kind of greenish color that we're accustomed. It's like kind of black and green with a little yellow that we're accustomed to seeing the swallowtail um, caterpillars. So as I shared, we like to protect them whenever possible. So as I shared this particular dill, I did tent some uh, bird netting over to protect them so they could complete their life, uh, their life cycle. But if we are um, moving patio furniture around or folding it up, check underneath uh, outdoor furniture or the barbecue, like the side table next to the barbecue to make sure there's no chrysalis because uh, it's really easy to fold up these things and bring it in. And then the chrysalis is now in the garage for the winter. It's just kind of funny, but this happens, you know, this does happen. And then understand that um, the number one job a caterpillar has is to eat. So when we plant those host plants, don't be surprised when those leaves get nibbled. It is really important just to uh, be okay with that. We, we really want to let them eat as much as they can. And trust me, the plants will respond and recover. It is not going to be detrimental to the plants. These uh, uh, butterflies and caterpillars uh, have um, evolved with these plants and um, everything is in a very nice harmony. It's very, uh, you know, they, they're used to, um, you know, working it out. So just wanted to share that. Okay, let's talk about moths because moths are kind of cool. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the hummingbird moth. This is one of my most favorites. Uh, it's a very important pollinator. Uh, many moths are. In fact, there's more than 11,000 species of moths in the U.S. alone. And uh, that makes up for more than um, all the birds and mammal species in North America, which is really surprising. But moths are going to outnumber the butterflies. Um, butterflies are their nearest relative, but they outnumber, uh, outnumber them 10 to 1. So. Um, just understand that uh, some moths are uh, major agricultural pests. However, others are really important pollinators, uh, especially due to their furry, this little fuzzy body that they have, it really holds on to that uh, pollen as they transfer it from flower to flower. And a lot of moths are nocturnal. So they're doing a lot of their pollinating services at night. So when we are um, planting a pollinator garden, let's not forget about some of the night bloomers, okay? We also wanna make sure we are changing out those light bulbs at night at the front porch or anywhere on the property for a yellow or golden uh, color tone light bulb and avoid any of the bright whites or those bright blue tones because that's also going to disrupt the moth, um, the way they kind of navigate. However, this moth right here, uh, does anyone know it is the adult of the tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm? I know some of you are like, I hate those hornworms, but if we can actually have a little tolerance, now I know they can take down a six foot tomato plant in like a day, but maybe we uh, we move it over into a terrarium and let it complete its life cycle by feeding it with those tomato uh, stems every day and then allow it to become this beautiful hummingbird moth, which is such an important pollinator, so fun. Okay, and now bees. Bees are a huge category, right? We all, we think of bees first whenever we think of pollinators, but bees are broken down into uh, two categories, social and solitary. And what I just like to pause at is that picture of the orange rose with the European honeybee. 
if you look a little closer, there's four tiny little native bees in there. I am not able to identify them because I wasn't able to get close enough, but understand that some of our native bees can be as small as an eighth of an inch. Okay, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, like our carpenter bee, carpenter bees can get as big as a kumquat. Okay, so we have a large range of shapes and sizes and even colors like the green metallic green sweat bee, which is my most favorite to see in the garden. Together, all of the bees, uh, be it social or, so or solitary, are going to large the formest, largest group of pollinators. There's over 20,000 known bee species bee species around the world. 4,000 of them are native to the United States and um, 1,600, 1,600 have been identified as native to California, which is almost half of the bee, native bee species throughout North America or you know, the United States. Um, let's just see, I, oh, European honeybees, were they are the only non-native species that we see here and they were brought to the U.S. in the 1600s with the explorers. Um, something else I want to share, it takes 1.6 million colonies of honeybees to pollinate California's 800,000 acres of almond trees. 1.6 million colonies of honeybees is needed to pollinate are 800,000 acres of almond trees. So just keep that in mind. Honeybees will also fly up to four miles from their hive collecting water, nectar, and pollen. And they can visit up to 100 flowers during each trip collecting. So um, that's just something I'd like to share the importance of protecting them and um, you know, uh, providing habitat and reducing pesticide usage. But from there, um, I just want to share, we have, um, well, let me just back up. I apologize. Honeybees are also going to be social bees. So uh, social bees mean that they will live in a hive with other bees and create like a community. Um, bumblebees, also, our bumblebees are native to the United States, and they also are going to be social bees where they live in a hive. But all the other bees we see are solitary bees. So they're, they're not living in hives, okay? So they're either going to be uh, ground dwellers, which this is a really great illustration from the Pollinator Partnership website, where they either are going to take advantage of an abandoned beetle uh, tunnel or little nest, or some bees do have the capability of digging little tunnels and they will nest inside the ground. Um, and about, well, 70% of our native bees are actually ground dwellers, okay? And then the other 30% are going to prefer to uh, create nests in uh, stems of plants or in wood, um, like reeds and so forth, bamboo canes. And that's why we see a lot of these bee blocks on the market, but you can also make your own. Um, the Xerces Society has a lot of great information on um, wood dwelling and ground dwelling bees. But if you're interested in making a bee block, you can get this um, template off of Xerces Society as well as the Audubon Society. Okay. Ooh, that was a lot. Um, let's talk about wasps because wasps are really cool and I really love them a lot. And uh, they are cousins with bees and ants, kind of fun. Uh, not um, something I want to share is there are yellow jackets and there are hornets. And I'd like you to put those in this other category. Um, wasps, uh, so many of the wasps we see in the garden, we don't even recognize as wasps. Uh, wasps are insects and um, they are uh, carnivorous and they hunt for other insects uh, or spiders but they also will um, visit flowers for nectar. So they are important pollinators. However, um, what I wanted to share is that they're not going to be the most effective pollinator because they typically don't have any fuzz or hair on their bodies. 
but they are really important. So we will see them, um, especially the little wasps. If you ever let your dill or parsley or cilantro go to flower and you see a lot of little tiny, almost looks like fungus gnats, those are actually little micro pollinators. Those are the little micro uh, wasps that are pollinating, but also are taking care of a lot of the pest insects in our garden. And something I wanna share is that we would not have figs without wasps. Wasps are, um, the, uh, are the pollinator for our figs. So that's pretty fun. They're responsible for pollinating over a thousand species of figs. So just keep that in mind for any of you that really enjoy a delicious fig uh, in the summertime. We have the wasps to thank. Okay, flies. A lot of us don't think of flies as important pollinators, but flies, uh, there's a very large category of flies. This happens to be a picture of a serpent fly. Uh, another name is hoverfly or flower fly. They have a lot of names. Uh, flies can carry pollen from one uh, flower to the next just by accident. They are not intentionally you know, pollinating. Um, again, they don't have a lot of fur or fuzz on their body. Some are more fuzzy than others, so they'll be more effective. But um, um, most people are aware that bees are vital for pollination, but don't really realize that uh, flies are second most important pollinator next to bees. So uh, what I'd like to share is um, something else you can thank flies for is if you like chocolate, chocolate, um, flies are the primary uh, pollinator of cacao. So that's kind of fun too. But they also are going to pollinate uh, pears and apples, strawberries, cherries, plums, apricots, peaches, raspberries, blackberries, roses, mangoes, um, and so many other plants. I mean, they're really important. And I'd say probably the most uh, common uh, fly you're gonna see that's pollinating is this serpent fly. This serpent fly, um, there's more than 6,000 uh, um, identified species of the serpent flies. They come in all shapes and sizes again, from super, super tiny to about a half an inch. I see the serpent flies all around my garden. They absolutely love feeding on the nectar and pollen of plants. And um, they live everywhere on the globe except for Antarctica. Um, the non-invasive um, sweet alyssum is their most favorite. So I have that planted around my roses and my lettuces just to attract them. Because as soon as they start to see aphids on those plants, they will lay eggs next to those aphids and the larva of the serpent fly will uh, hunt those aphids and keep the aphid population in check for you. So really important, not only as a pollinator, but as a uh, pest uh, management tool. Okay, and beetles. Beetles were historically the very first pollinator and they make up the largest group of pollinating animals because there's so many of them. Okay, uh, they're responsible for pollinating about 88% of the flowers around the world. So flowering plants around the world are really uh, dependent on the beetles. So that's pretty fun, right? And again, um, they just cruise around and they eat pollen and they just bring pollen from flower to flower. Um, and you know, they're just doing their own thing. Now, the soldier beetle is also a beneficial insect where not only is it eating pollen, it's also going to eat some of our pest insects such as aphids. So you get uh, a double bonus when we have uh, soldier beetles and uh, serpent flies in the garden. Hummingbirds, another important uh, um, pollinator that's native to the Americas. They have very good eyesight and are attracted to bright colored flowers such as red, but more importantly, flowers that are shaped like a tube. So uh, tubular flowers like fuchsias, uh, cestrums, uh, 
verbenas, things, some salvias, things like that are going to be ideal for the hummingbirds. Uh, hum hummingbirds have to eat several times their weight in nectar every day. So it is really nice for them to have a variety of plants that they can really source and get uh, nectar from. When they're raising their young, they will also go for pest insects. So again, they will do a nice service to our garden, but as long as we have a lot of flowers for them to get that nectar to uh, keep them going. And wind. Wind is another important uh, pollinator, believe it or not, but primarily of our grass and cereal crops. So I just like to throw that in there. A lot of us aren't really fond of the wind pollinating plants uh, or the wind pollinate moving the pollen because it gives us allergies, but just know it does have many economic importances uh, and it is an important part of our um, the ecosystems out there, so. So how do we protect our pollinators? Well, we talked a little bit about protecting them from predators and from pets and children, but we also wanna protect them from gardeners. So uh, what that means is that we really want to uh, kind of be mindful when we're in the garden. We wanna pay attention, we wanna look. If I see bees uh, really hitting one of my salvias, um, I'm just going to you know, move in very closely or avoid that area. You know, I'm not afraid of bees and I feel very comfortable uh, weeding and providing garden maintenance very close to bees, but not everybody feels as comfortable. So let's just give them some space and let, get, let them do their important job that they're doing for us. We also want to, um, you know, keep air, some areas of our garden uncultivated and mulch free. Though, though mulch is going to, provide an amazing benefit to our garden by reducing water evaporation rate and keeping those root zones cool. Leave a section of the planting beds uh, a little bare and uncultivated. We don't need a lot, but just a little bit so that we can um, really invite those soil dwelling native uh, pollinators. We always want to avoid using those leaf blowers uh, boy, those can be really problematic because we're just blowing the leaves everywhere and really removing that uh, the mulch uh, that's protecting the soil. We want to prune mindfully. We really want to kind of pay attention and see, is there any activity of beneficial insects? Are there any surface fly larvas hanging out on our roses eating those aphids, you know, before we, you know, wipe those aphids off or we prune. And then, as I mentioned before, we want to check our patio furniture before we store it. And then, of course, we want to avoid using pesticides at all costs. So tips for attracting pollinators, we're going to embrace the seasons. We are going to uh, plant for year round blooms whenever possible. Now, of course, during the uh, very cold months or weeks of winter, not a lot's blooming, but our pollinators are also not active. However, if we can have a couple things in bloom, on those warm days, there's always a couple days that warm up to be 80 degrees in December. So I, I'm very happy when I've got my asters in bloom or borage or something that's available for those go-getters. And then we wanna favor California native plants whenever possible uh, because they're gonna provide a better nutrition for our, our pollinators. We're gonna go large. We're gonna plant the same variety of plants in swaths or clumps of approximately three by three feet. Now, if we don't have that kind of space, it's fine, but just know if we do have space, it is nice to plant the same variety. So that might be catmint or nepeta, that could just be two planted next to each other that will expand out to three feet, you know, um, or it could be one salvia that's gonna grow three feet by three feet, or it could be maybe uh, four uh, uh, time, you know, the herb thyme, maybe we plant four in a row. And when that's in flower, that can actually expand to three feet. So just kind of think about that. But again, it is not necessary. We want to avoid hybrid plants for the reasons that I mentioned before. Typically, the blossoms do not provide pollen, nectar, or fragrance. So let's just stick with plants that are not going to be hybrids, that are going to be straight species or natives. Don't forget those night bloomers. We wanna include the larval host plant if we wanna attract butterflies. 
Uh, we want to reduce or remove that lawn. So Emily, you're off to a great start. Uh, we want to provide that water source. Um, and then, you know, that water does evaporate very quickly. So sometimes we'll be, um, you know, replenishing it throughout the day. And then we want to avoid pesticides, even the eco-friendly ones. So there's a little bit of a theme here that I'm repeating, but mainly because it's so important. Um, this is really awesome. So the Cal native, um, oh, Xersus, the Xersus Society has this really awesome plant list to attract pollinators with California native plants. I encourage you to go have a peek at it. It is a really a wonderful list and it's very easy to read and it breaks down the time of bloom, the color of bloom and um, you know other details like that. Because when we want to, when we're planting um, uh, flowers or when we're planting a garden to attract our pollinators, a variety is going to be key. So trying to get that nice diversity. So planting again, flowers that are in a variety of shapes and sizes and colors. Uh, bright colors are great. Uh, white is also considered a bright color though, especially for our night, um, our, our night um, pollinators, our nocturnal ones. Um, we wanna also provide a variety of shapes and sizes. Fragrance does not matter. So here's just a list of a few things such as flowers that look like a sunflower or a daisy, um, such as let's just say the Erigeron or Cosmos or Rebecca's or Echinacea. It's really what we're seeing, what might look like one flower to us, those petals are actually rays and it's the coin in the middle, that little yellow button in the middle that has the hundreds of flowers for our pollinators or flowers that grow in clusters of tiny flowers. So like yarrow or sweet alyssum, ceanothus. Uh, these are actually clusters of a lot of small flowers. And then for our butterflies and our hummingbirds and our larger bees, we can go with small and large tubular flowers such as the salvias, those abutilons, trumpet vines and so forth. So we want to just have a nice selection of flowering plants whenever possible. And here's just a photo of some of these plants. Um, starting from the top left, the yellow, golden yellow and moving right, we have Nyphophia, which the butterflies and hummingbirds love. Then we have Agastaches, we have Cestrum, we have a species, um, a Snapdragon, and then we immediately go down to the Tithlonia or the Mexican sunflower, which we see a monarch visiting. Then we move to the left, we've got Verbena. And then um, this is not a Queen Anne's lace, but let's just say it is. I could also say that this would be, you know, these flowers look similar to cilantro flowers, which I always let my cilantro go to uh, flower because the pollinators love it. And then of course, scabiosa. And then in the middle, we've got the red verbena and then the abutilon. So these are just some um, flowers that I have around my garden that I see a lot of activity. And then of course, if we are just um, looking to plant one thing, uh, consider adding a habitat hero to our garden. Habitat heroes are going to be quite no notable for their ability to attract a significant amount and variety of important wildlife, including pollinators and other beneficial insects. So buckwheat is one of my most favorites. I think it's also gorgeous. Uh, then we have the manzanita, um, California native oaks are going to be kind of large. Maybe we already have them in our garden, but no, they are incredibly important. And when we see those oak moths uh, decimating those leaves, don't worry. That's actually food for all of our birds. And let me tell you, that oak is um, can, can live through a little bit of damage, okay? All of these plants have uh, adapted to the wildlife stresses that uh, they are in partnership with. And then of course, salvias and any of the culinary herbs are going to be, uh, you're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck. And then when we're looking at plants, um, let's just consider, you know, not always deadheading them or grooming them so quickly. You know, a lot of the native plants will go into berry form, uh, which is going to provide a lot of nutrition for our birds. Um, 
and other wildlife on the property. And then some of the seeds such as the asters or the Japanese anemones or even the, um, the clematis, which is the bottom right corner. These are gonna be seeds for our uh, birds to eat, but then they're also going to use these, the fluff as nesting material. So let's just uh, take a pause at the end of the season, but when we're doing uh, a cleanup and let some of these things exist uh, so that our, our ecology, the garden ecology can really benefit. And so plants for pollinators, there are some wonderful resources such as the Solano Master Gardeners, the California Native Plant Society. And then of course you can find this Healthy Gardens fact sheet on the Our Water, Our World website. So I'm gonna just finish up by talking a little bit about some things we should be aware of. And one, if you've joined my programs before, you know that I always say, or I've recently started saying that um, pesticides don't solve the pest problem. They're just killing the pest, but they're also killing other beneficial organisms, such as beneficial insects and pollinators. So when we have pest problems, we really want to address the cause. And that's one thing I hope that we're able to provide with our programs is helping you identify what is causing those problems so we can correct the problem without having to use a pesticide. But there are pesticides on the market and some of us do use them, um, which is fine. However, I would like to bring your awareness to the neonicotinoids. Please avoid these at all costs, whatever you can do. Uh, the science is coming out uh, more readily now that these are, are way more problematic than we once knew. Not only are they a water quality issue, uh, finding their ways into our waterways and now being toxic to the waterways, but they are also, um, the way they work is that they absorb into the plant tissue. We apply them as a soil drench around the root zone or we can spray them on the plants and then, then it gets absorbed into the tissue. It will be absorbed into all parts of the plant. So when we have a pollinator come and visit, they're actually absorbing this pesticide. Uh, the pesticide also moves through the root systems and it also is very, um, it moves very easily with water. So it can move through the soil and uh, interwine and move to uh, the other root systems of other plants and then move through those plant parts and beyond. So if we have, let's just say our roses in our garden and it borders uh, a wildflower garden that we have or a pollinator garden or even an open space, the root systems of those roses are going to expand beyond what we think. And that pesticide is now going to migrate into other areas of the garden and um, get absorbed into other unintended plants which then is going to um, have a significant impact on our pollinators. So please just avoid these products. If we are uh, buying plants from a nursery, you are welcome to ask your nursery if they are bringing plants in that have been treated with neonicotinoids. It is really nice to support nurseries that don't, uh, that bring in plants that don't treat their, uh, that have they're bringing plants in from growers that don't treat with neonics. Um, there's some more information on the pesticide.org website that you can um, look at. However, you are also welcome just to ask your nursery. This is a little bit of a complicated question. Um, nurseries that I work with are going to have a mix. Some plants they bring in are from growers that treat with neonics and they also will bring in plants that are not treated. So you have choices. And then I wanted to finish up by talking a little bit about how we can use integrated pest management to protect our pollinators. So we talked about identification as being key. It's very important. If we can't identify the pest, we're not gonna be able to solve the problem. We wanna then set our gardens up for success. And then we wanna reduce or eliminate pesticide usage. So a recap for those of you that are not familiar with integrated pest management, 
It is a decision-making process and we do use science-based strategies. It allows us to look at the garden as a whole to identify really what is going on because oftentimes what we're seeing are symptoms of a problem and we wanna dive in a little deeper and ask what is truly the problem at hand? Is it that the irrigation is broken and that's why this plant is looking wilted or is all of a sudden getting affected with a fungal problem or an insect problem? Or is it a problem that we can live with that we know is just part of the spring or summer or fall cycle? So prevention is always going to be key. We're going to monitor and see how we can prevent these pest problems from happening. Identification is also key, as I mentioned. And then if we need to take some steps, we're going to take action steps. Those action steps in IPM are called controls. So cultural controls is bolstering the health of the garden and really favoring the health of the plants. And then discouraging any pests that might come. Mechanical controls would be using the tools to prevent pest problems, such as traps and barriers, weeding tools, and other items. Biological controls, which is um, using beneficial organisms, such as beneficial insects uh, to manage pest problems and supporting the ecology of the garden that is really supporting the overall ecosystem. And then we can use chemical controls, which are the pesticides, but we're uh, going to use them when we've exhausted all the other options, when we're really clear and sure of what the pest is, the timing of that activity of that pest, and we're always going to use an eco-friendly um, no, another, no other options. They're always eco-friendly. So uh, here we are, proper identification. We want to understand that life cycle of that pest. So for instance, we're a couple weeks away from spittle bug season. Spittle bugs are those little insects that look like someone spit on your plants. They really kind of hang out for about two weeks, then they're gone. So do we need to take action? No, they're not doing any harm to our plants. Do they look unsightly? Yes. Uh, do we understand their life cycle? Yeah, it's about two weeks. Bam, and then they're over. So there's a high level of tolerance there. But then if it was something like uh, aphids, aphids are just going to come every spring because that's what they do. Um, we can uh, do some things that could prevent them. However, what I really want to be on the hunt for is our beneficial insects and see are they present? Or are the natural enemies there? Because if they are, then I just have to be patient because I know they're going to take care of it for me. And then setting our gardens up for success looks like adding compost to the soil and feeding with organic fertilizers and then protecting the soil with that nice two, three inch layer of mulch around those root zones, of course, in accordance to CAL FIRE's recommendations. Um, we're going to leave space between plants a little bare so that we can uh, you know, support our ground dwelling native bees. Uh, we're always going to plant the right plant in the right place according to our microclimates of our garden. We're going to water deeply and less often as the plants grow. And we want to provide healthy garden maintenance and monitor for pest problems. So chemical controls, if we have to use them, we want to understand the unintended consequences of our action first, OK? Then we always want to use them as a last resort, as I mentioned, when we've exhausted all the other options and we want to read the label and ap apply the pesticides according to the label. When we're applying pesticides according to the label, specifically the eco-friendly ones, they are going to be eco-friendly. If we don't follow the label and we happen to apply them incorrectly, there's a chance the eco-friendly uh, pesticides are now um, not applied properly and no longer are going to be eco-friendly. So that's why it's so important to read the label and to understand what we're using. We wanna know our pest and we wanna only target that pest. We're not spraying down the entire garden, okay? So we always wanna choose that eco-friendly option. Uh, we want to apply these pesticides at the end of the day uh, at sundown when our pollinators are going to less likely be active, they're already uh, tucked away for the night. 
And we want to always avoid applying uh, trees, shrubs, and perennials when they're in bloom. We really just want to avoid applying any pesticide to those blooms. A really cool resource that you can check out is on the UCIPM website, which is the Bee Precaution Pesticide Rating. This is pretty awesome. I am going to send everybody an email afterwards that will have a resource page that will list all the websites that have mentioned so far, so you can reference those at your own. Then again, we can always uh, check out the Our Water, Our World website and the UCIPM website. These are going to be our go-tos for helping us identify what the pests are and how to manage them. Um, if we're looking for eco-friendly products, we can always go to the OMRI website, which is the Organical, Organic Materials Review Institute as well as the um, National Pesticide Information Center. That's really one of my favorites when I wanna understand the mode of action of the pesticide I'm using and any unintended consequences that I might not be aware of. And then for more information, there are some really great resources on gardening for pollinators on the Solano Master Gardeners website. And then as I shared, I will send all of these out to you, but these are some pretty fun resources. So the Xerces Society, National Wildlife Federation, the North American Butterfly Association, Bay Nature Institute, and the Butterfly Moths of North America. So when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So I just like to share everything is connected and we sure hope to see you at our next programs, which is Growing Your Own Salad, which will be next month, and then Drought Proofing Our Garden. So both I'm going to really go into a little bit more on all of those ways we would take advantage of compost, mulch, organic fertilizers, and really how to water. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I said it was a pretty solid 45 minutes, and boy, <laughs> was it. Amazing amount of information, Suzanne. Thank you so much. I want to, there are two questions. I'm hoping, I know it's six right now, but if folks can stay on, I'm hoping they can hear the answer to their question. The first is, what is the name of the plant that the syrphid flies lay their eggs on? Oh, well, that's a really great question. So syrphid flies really love sweet alyssum. It's one of their most favorites. So I will plant sweet alyssum around my vegetable, uh, like my raised beds where I've got vegetable starts, as well as my roses, because my vegetables and my roses have a tendency to get a lot of aphids. If that surfeit fly sees that there's aphids on that rose or on that lettuce or on that chard, it will lay an egg next to those aphids on that plant. So I will go on a hunt and I do have pictures of eggs from surfeit flies on my roses next to aphids. That is incredible. Um, okay, the second question that we have is, do the pollinators other than bees remember their path to return to areas they have visited previously? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Well, I know for a fact the hummingbirds do because I plant sweet peas on this deer fence every year. And one year they were just kind of late. It was a very, um, I don't know what was going on, but the sweet peas were just lagging. And the hummingbird came over and went to the fence line where the sweet peas normally are, looked at the fence, turned around and looked at me. It was pretty much like, what gives? <laughs> so I was like, wow. Uh, yeah, so I would say that our, uh, the pollinators, I'm just gonna say all of them, are a heck of a lot smarter than we uh, think they are. So I'm going to say, yes, they are going to remember. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, so there are not any more questions in the question and answer, nor in the chat. Um, so one question I have is for the record, is there a recording of this presentation that we'll share with all of the folks who registered? Yes. So everyone that registered, because the recording I think is still on, yeah. So uh, that was so great that Emily hit the recording to start. Um, I'll trim off the end and I'll trim off the front a little bit. And then I will share the link to the recording for everyone that's joined us. And then Emily, 